Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, welcoming you to a quick set of essential tips for Company of Heroes 3. While the game has a lot of familiar mechanics for veterans of the series, there are some new tools at your disposal with this latest edition, and so today's video should hopefully help veterans and newcomers alike beyond what the in-game tutorial has to offer. If the video helps you out, consider leaving a like, and if you're looking for folks to play with, you might want to join the Discord linked in the description down below. Apart from that, if you haven't already bought the game and this guide piques your interest, I've got a link in the pinned comment and description where you can grab the game directly from Relic while supporting the channel if you'd like. With all that said, with no more time to waste, and with timestamps down below, let's begin. Environmental Destruction, Cover, and Flanking Company of Heroes 3 takes both Environmental Destruction and the Cover system extremely seriously, and as before, choosing your angles of approach and hiding behind the right thing at the right time can be the difference between life and death. Take cover by ordering your units behind buildings, debris, sandbags, vehicles, or literally anything else littered around the battlefield that could conceivably block bullets. You'll see their destination pips take on a variety of colors to confirm whether or not you're sending them into cover. Gray pips imply no cover, yellow pips imply light cover, and green pips suggest heavy cover. In all my time playing so far, I've not yet noticed red pips that used to denote negative cover, but if you ever see them, Keep in mind that negative cover is actively worse than no cover, and should be avoided at all costs. Naturally, with the idea of taking cover comes the need to flank, and the fear of being flanked. Two equivalent units firing at each other from behind equivalent degrees of cover can stay engaged for a needlessly long amount of time, and to break the deadlock, you'll want to try and approach your enemies from a different angle that doesn't put the cover between your units and theirs. Naturally. Your opponents will try to reorient themselves to counter any flanking attempts, and that's why it's great to have units drawing their attention in one direction while sending supporting troops in from the flanks, switching roles as needed if the enemy changes their cover situation. Flanking is also especially useful when dealing with heavy machine gun teams who can suppress and pin units that are approaching them head-on the moment they step out of cover. Drawing their attention in one direction while supporting troops flank them to take them out is crucial in keeping all avenues of approach open for your soldiers. Keep in mind that units hiding in cover are bunched up a lot more than units that are standing in the open. This makes them more susceptible to the effects of grenades, flamethrowers, and artillery barrages that all cause damage within an area of effect. It's worth noting that flames from a flamethrower completely ignore the effects of cover, so they're great for overcoming an enemy hiding behind cover or even inside buildings. Make sure to use such weapons against a particularly dug-in enemy, but be prepared to pull back from similar threats on your own side too. While cover is a great solution for most engagements, it does still have its weaknesses. Another such weakness is against snipers, who can relatively consistently pick off infantry units even if they're hiding behind full cover. Situational awareness and the willingness to retreat until the threat is cleared are both equally important. Keep in mind that Vehicles can also take advantage of cover, and though they won't display this color-coded system of pips when giving move orders, you can safely hide them behind bigger structures and terrain to protect them from most types of direct enemy fire. On the topic of vehicles, though, you need to be extremely careful with regards to how they move around the battlefield. Heavier equipment especially will crush absolutely anything in its path, reducing walls, sandbags, vehicle wreckages, and debris into nothing but rubble removing structures that would otherwise have acted as cover for your infantry. If you want to preserve certain structures, make sure to navigate around them, and try not to fire massive shells into said structures either. Environmental destruction is cranked up here, and every shot, every move, and every miscalculation can prove extremely expensive. With that said, these very same elements can act to your advantage. You can destroy cover that your opponents might want to use by simply driving over it, or you can destroy vehicles that your opponent might otherwise try to recover by simply nudging the wreckage with your own vehicle. That aside, at times, debris on the battlefield can open up new angles of approach that didn't exist before, since the new debris acts as additional cover. Whether it's chunks of a building or the wreckage of a previously active vehicle, use the evolving battlefield to your advantage, and before it all turns to rubble, don't hesitate to use buildings to your advantage too, as they count as heavy cover and come with many advantages besides. That is, until they get reduced to rubble, taking all of the garrisoned troops with them. With that said though, they come with a few considerations of their own, so let's discuss. 
clearing and holding buildings. Buildings can be occupied by most infantry units, allowing the occupying unit to take advantage of the defensive benefits of taking cover inside a building while limiting their ability to use certain special weapons, like grenades. They'll still be able to use weapons teams, so bazookas, heavy machine guns, and snipers will work just fine, which means the downsides to occupying a building are pretty minimal. A unit inside a building is considered to be in heavy cover, safe from suppression and pinning, taking minimal damage under fire. What's more, with verticality playing a key role and extra height providing better lines of sight, buildings are a great way to get the high ground and acquire the intel and better firing angles they tend to provide. Keep in mind these firing angles are limited to the directions in which the building has windows, and the number of individuals that can actually shoot is also limited by the window count. Buildings with flat roofs are especially beneficial since troops can post up on the roof instead with access to more firing lines and more active guns at any given time as well. Ultimately, this means that buildings are a very powerful form of cover that you should try and secure at important strategic locations when possible, and that you should try and deny your enemy as well. Particularly powerful artillery bombardments can absolutely level a building in an instant, as can sustained fire from small arms and tanks alike. Keep in mind that you can preemptively damage or destroy a building by using the attack move command on it or by ordering bombardments on it even when it sits empty. This denies your enemy the option to use it in the first place, though if occupied, a building's health is tracked separately from the unit inside it and if the building collapses, it kills everybody inside. This is a great way to punish an enemy unit garrisoned inside a building, but it's also a great reason to avoid garrisoning extremely damaged buildings in the first place and why you should always keep an eye on a building's current health. Units take some time to enter a building and set up, and they take some time to tear down and leave a building too. If they're in the middle of that process as the building's coming down around them, they will die in the collapse. Note that at times, collapsing a building will be the best way of removing your enemies from it, by simply removing the building itself. At other times, you might want to take it for yourself though. In such a case, you'll find flamethrowers and grenades are especially good at damaging units that are hiding inside buildings, and if you don't have those on hand, you can try and use the breach action available to some infantry units instead. It takes some time to execute, but it's much faster than using small arms fire to eliminate the unit within, and it causes them a great deal of damage too. The previous inhabitants will typically survive with just a few individuals, and so you'll want to breach a building in pairs for maximum efficiency one unit to actually clear the building, and another to wait outside and gun down the enemy that manages to escape. If you find yourself on the receiving end of a breach, keep in mind that you're able to order your units to leave the building before the action actually causes damage to them, and if you're quick enough to pull this off, this can save valuable resources and lives. Sometimes the unit inside a building can pose a particular threat to anybody trying to approach them, and in such a case, you can try and find an alternative entrance to the building, potentially avoiding the cone of fire of, say, a heavy machine gun team, or you can use smoke grenades to close off the building's line of sight, allowing your troops to sneak up, breach, clear, and occupy the building for themselves. On the topic of stealing things from the opposing side, though, let's discuss working with vehicles. Vehicles have received a bit of a facelift in Company of Heroes 3 in ways that are well worth discussing. It might come as no surprise to you that a tank showing up in the middle of an infantry battle can completely turn the tide of a skirmish, and you might be even less surprised to hear that troops can move around the map more quickly aboard a troop transport than on foot. Vehicles provide plenty of advantages on the battlefield, though they can also be cumbersome at times, unable to navigate narrow alleyways or otherwise crushing everything in their path, leaving no cover for your troops to hide behind. Not only are armed vehicles a daunting threat to unleash upon your enemies, Sometimes they're the only way to tow particularly heavy pieces of equipment around the battlefield, and they also bring unique capabilities to provide support to your soldiers beyond their sheer horse and firepower. As briefly mentioned previously, vehicles can act as cover for your troops to hide behind. This is true for when the vehicle has been turned into a wreck, but it's also true for when it's a fully operational and mobile piece of equipment. Well-positioned half-tracks and tanks can introduce cover to the battlefield where there previously wasn't any, and advancing behind a vehicle is a very viable approach to keep your infantry safe from enemy fire. It can be a touch risky as a misclick or slight miscalculation will leave your infantry exposed, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Apart from marching behind a vehicle, 
infantry can often climb on top of the vehicles too. Of course, troop transports can transport troops, it's right in the name, but I'm talking about tanks and other non-transport vehicles that can now support at least a single infantry unit atop it while moving. This is a great way to get some added mobility on the battlefield without spending the resources for it, and it enables combined arms tactics with your infantry and armor arriving at the same location at the same time without the need to coordinate efforts. Hitchhikers will immediately hop off when the fighting starts, but they'll take cover behind their ride immediately too, taking advantage of the heavy cover. Keep in mind though that, as scary as tanks and other vehicles might be at first, a well-prepared foe will have equipment on hand to take it out. To that end, pay attention to how armor works for your vehicles, as highlighted in the unit details panel. All vehicles have armor divided into front, side, and rear, with front armor being the strongest, rear armor being the weakest, and side armor being somewhere in between. In some cases, the difference between front and side armor is negligible, and securing shots into the back of said vehicle is the only way to get real damage done quickly. When taking on such a vehicle, you'll want to try and sneak up on it from behind with any kind of anti-armor equipment. Much like flanking infantry, flanking vehicles can be accomplished by drawing their attention in one direction while having them exposed in another, using a pair of anti-armor units against a single piece of armor when the opportunity presents itself. Don't forget to use anti-tank grenades and satchel charges to threaten an enemy from one side as, for example, a heavy tank is rolling up on them from the other. A lot of the time though, a vehicle's side armor is weak enough to make it a viable target for most anti-armor equipment. It's a safe bet to hit an enemy vehicle in the back, but hitting it on the side will always be better than attacking it head-on. In the interest of presenting your own vehicle's strongest side to the enemy at all times then, make sure to never order a vehicle out of a firefight with a simple click. Instead, always give them the reverse order to make sure they drive backwards away from the threat, presenting their most armored front side to the enemy at all times. Despite best efforts, vehicles will take damage from time to time, and you should keep an eye on any resulting status effects. True shock will prevent the unit from firing or moving momentarily, while engine damage will slow it down until it's been repaired by quite a bit. Engineer and Pioneer teams can repair damaged vehicles, with multiple teams working together to finish the job more quickly, but no matter how many Engineer and Pioneer units you use, they cannot salvage a wreck. In order to do that, you'll need to recruit specific recovery vehicles as listed in their tooltips. These guys can either scrap wrecks to acquire resources, or they can turn wrecks into fully functioning vehicles once again, albeit with reduced health, at a reduced cost compared to a freshly recruited unit, saving you valuable resources that you would have otherwise used to recruit a replacement. Note that you can recover any vehicles on the battlefield, not just your own. This is a great way of acquiring powerful enemy vehicles while also preventing them from saving on recruitment costs. Think of it like sending your units in to steal heavy machine guns or anti-tank guns that the enemy brought to the battlefield. You're just keeping equipment away from the enemy and forcing them to invest more resources where they otherwise wouldn't have. Keep in mind that salvaging does take a fair bit of time and your vehicle is stationary for that duration. Make sure to provide it with supporting units to keep it alive as it completes its task. Ultimately, that's a good thing to try and do for all your units. Make sure they survive. While it might be tempting to give your soldiers a glorious death rather than order a retreat to pull them back, it is absolutely essential that you prioritize the survival of a unit over the heroic last stand that you might think you're giving them. Each unit costs manpower to recruit, alongside additional resources if relevant. Each unit accumulates experience over time, gaining veterancy that improves their performance. Each unit can be upgraded to gain access to special weapons or capabilities. Each unit starts from scratch when freshly recruited. To put it simply, recruiting a unit where you could have retreated and replenished an existing one is a waste of resources and potentially represents the loss of an upgraded veteran unit that performs better than a fresh one. At times, you might want a unit to die off and free up your pop cap for something in particular, but typically, when a unit is extremely threatened, you'll want to use the retreat order to bring them back to the nearest base. The order cannot be cancelled once given, and it gives the unit a significant boost to their movement speed, making their safe return just a little bit more likely. Clicking the retreat button is different from manually ordering a return to base. That movement speed buff is absolutely huge and can make the difference between life and death. 
It also frees them from the effects of suppression and being pinned, and at times, it's the only way to recover from pinning. Ideally, things won't get so bad in the first place. By regularly keeping your troops topped up, you won't have to worry about retreating as often, and in order to do so, you can establish bases at specific strategic points, particularly in the campaign, or you can acquire specific vehicles that provide healing and replenishment capabilities to units around them as long as none of them are involved in active combat. Keep in mind that these vehicles will often have upgrades that remove these healing and replenishing capabilities, as noted in the upgrade tooltip, so watch out for that. And keep in mind also that healing and replenishing are two different mechanics. Individuals within a unit take damage to their health and then die, so it's possible for a living individual to be close to death, and this will be reflected in the unit's health bar. Healing brings these hurt individuals back to full strength, while replenishing actively replaces missing individuals and can only be done if there's enough population cap left to do so. These vehicles and buildings can have automatic replenishment turned on and off to rid yourself of the micromanagement, but at times you'll want to be picky about which unit is being topped up, especially if you're close to the limit of your population cap. Either way, it's pretty much always better to retreat a squad rather than lose it, and the same applies to vehicles too. Reverse them out of conflict, and have your engineers or pioneers repair them before sending them back out to fight. To maximize your infantry survival, try to avoid clumping them up too much. A stray shell, a grenade, a flamethrower, or a bombing run might just wipe your entire infantry out in one fell swoop. Keep them apart, and stay alert with regards to incoming AoE attacks. When you're moving into an unexplored area, you should keep an eye out for enemy positions. Use terrain height differences and buildings to gain the high ground and better lines of sight over the battlefield, or pull out the recon flares and planes to gather intel before entering an area. Get further details about weapon emplacements like machine gun nests and anti-tank guns by selecting them to see exactly what they're watching over, and perhaps use smoke grenades to obscure their view, allowing you to sneak up on them or cross what would otherwise be a kill zone. Cutting enemy line of sight is an excellent way to keep your soldiers alive. As for weapon teams of your own, Try to think of them as part of a bigger squad to ensure their survivability. A heavy machine gun unit is completely useless if flanked, but if there's always an accompanying rifle unit, they'll have backup. The same applies to snipers, anti-tank teams, mortar teams, and anybody else that can be easily picked off if isolated. Use squad tactics to work as a team, with units supporting one another to make up for gaps. They're much more likely to survive that way, and there's no frustration quite like watching your heavy machine gun team slowly pack their equipment up while being shot at in the back of the head, and then watching the enemy pick up the heavy machine gun they left behind. Units working in tandem, pulling back and pushing forward together, supporting each other, flanking, and ultimately staying alive is what Company of Heroes is all about. There you have it folks, four essential sets of tips that should arm you with the knowledge to get ahead on the battlefield. If you have any thoughts of your own or any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments, and apart from that, if the video helps you out, consider leaving a like. Again, if you're looking for folks to play with, you might want to join the Discord linked in the description down below, and apart from that, if you haven't already bought the game, I've got a link in the pinned comment and description, where you can grab it again directly from Relic while supporting the channel. Expect plenty more Company of Heroes 3 to come on the channel folks, and feel free to subscribe if you're interested. But apart from that, as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.